Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, You are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. And I'll take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance, while the Lord spoke to Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Now we'll pick up uh, what we're going to preach from today in verse 12 of Exodus 33. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, Cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now, in a little bit, we'll read a couple of uh, verses from the next chapter, but we're going to begin here back at verse 12. Um, well, let's pray just for a moment. Father, I place the rest of this service into your hands, and I do not know what you would like to accomplish here. I am sure that my, my own goal for this service is probably way too modest and too small. Um, but I, I know you would probably like to, like to do far more than we might be able to imagine or think in the moments that we have together. Would you help us, would you speak to us through the word today in Christ's name? Now God has spoken to Moses and he said, I am pretty sick of you people. If I were to go any further, I would kill you. He says that twice in the early part of this chapter, which I read. It wasn't on the screen. But uh, Moses really steps in and stands in the gap. Now, we've been working through this story, this narrative, and some of what I'm going to say today will be a little uh, bit of repetition because I've probably said some of it before. But this is such a critical time in the history of Israel in the Old Testament. Moses says, and this is kind of an enigmatic statement, I don't really understand this, 
But he said to the Lord, You have been telling me, Leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Now God had said, I will send an angel. And he will drive out these nation tribes that live in the land. And uh, you will be able to go in, but I'm not going. If I went with you at all, I would destroy you. Someone called America. I have a book in my library called America, uh, United States. The title of the book is God's Almost Chosen People. Americans have wanted to think we were exceptional, and uh, we have been blessed in many ways, and I am thankful to be a citizen here, but these really were the chosen people. They existed only because they were chosen. That was the only thing that separated them from Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or the Canaanites or the Perizzites or the Philistines or any of these other people that lived in the ancient Near East. They were chosen and, and God says, I'm so sick of you that if I were to travel with you at all, I would destroy you. I've had it with you. And Moses says, you haven't. Let me know who you will send with us. But you have said this, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. Now, Moses was not a perfect man. If you read these stories, I challenge you to do that at some point. Moses had a real problem with anger. When he shows up as an adult, having been raised in all the privileges of Pharaoh's palace, he sees an Israelite, one of his people, being mistreated, and he murders a guy. So, you know, it's, it's vigilante justice, you might say. Then he has to flee. And if you, if you read the whole story of Moses, you'll see that eventually his anger does him in, and he doesn't even get to go in the promised land. But here he's saying, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. Verse 13, if you are pleased with me, this is so critical. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, this nation is your people. Psalm 25 is one of my favorite psalms, and there's a phrase in there that says, Show me your ways, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and all day long my hope is in you. The desire of our hearts, Christians, should be that God would show us his way, his ways, and teach us his path. We are so caught up in whatever the world wants us to be interested in. And there's a whole industry that tries to influence how we think. Many of us, I'm guilty, <laughs> seldom are out of the reach of a screen, whether it's a big screen on a wall, a little screen on a table, or a smaller screen in our hands. And the people who control these things influence, you might even say, they control our lives. They want to influence our thinking, whether it's about politics or what I might purchase if I go to Walmart or wherever. But we need to be people who are in hard pursuit after God and saying to him, show me your ways, not the ways of the world. Teach me your paths. I thought of this this morning in praise team practice. I don't know what made me think of it. The, the two Michelles were here. And uh, the, the, I like having them on the platform. They just, well, they don't make me look better, I guess. Uh, that's probably a stretch. But I just like having them up there. They're great. And I thought of something today about a, a jazz musician named John Zorn. Um, you've probably never heard of him. And he's sort of at avant-garde jazz. He's not mainstream at all. I mean, he's as far away from Kenny G as you can get, even if that means anything to you. But someone asked John Zorn about the Seinfeld show. Now, that's not current, but most everybody knows of the influence of Seinfeld and those other shows about nothing, as they've all been called. He had never heard of Seinfeld. He had one thing in life, and that was improving his craft as a musician. And he makes about two albums a year, and it works with all kinds of people. Really. Can you imagine living in a world where you don't know who's on television? You don't know who the stars are? I find that sort of refreshing. 
We're obsessed with that sort of thing. There was a game probably several decades back now called Trivial Pursuit. And that was what it was all about. Trivia. It was like us and People magazine all wrapped up in a little box and you ask questions about popular culture. But Moses, realizing the privilege and burden in which he stands of trying to lead these people who have shown that they have no depth of character at the slightest in a test of their character, they go off into open idolatry and they try to excuse it by saying so many things that don't really count. And he knows the burden he has. He faces this burden and he says, Lord, you've got to help me to know you. Show me your way so that I may know you. And church, we need to be people who are learning the ways of God. And we do that as we read the word, as we seek out the great devotional writers of Christian history like Chambers and Tozier and, and others. Um, and and it's, it's a battle. Years ago, I was a youth pastor for about three years, and there were three of us that would gather in an office in the morning, and we would read Oswald Chambers by utmost for his highest. And in one of those little morning devotionals, Chambers' words included this, your relationship with God is always under attack. It is. It's always under attack. Now, we talk about the faithfulness of God and how he will never leave us or forsake us, and that is true. God's not going anywhere, but our relationship with him is always being assaulted in one way or the other by the world or sometimes by inner conflict. And we must be people who are on purpose seeking the face of God, seeking him alone in intimacy. Moses' secret to success were his times on the mountain alone with God or his time in the tent of meeting where he talked to God. And this is interesting because it sort of is, um, it's, there, there are two images given here, but in that tent of meeting, he talked with God face to face. And I think it simply means not that God actually walked in there and, you know, as Jesus and, and they got real close like this. Because men don't like that, do they? If you want to talk to a guy, you never talk to a guy face to face. Uh, he'll be intimidated or irritated. And either one of those is not good. But he had an intimate relationship with God. And he reminded the Lord, this nation is your people. And it was. Verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. Church, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. What made Israel different? Earlier in this chapter, they go in the morning and they take off all their jewelry. What made them different from all the pagan nations? The fact they didn't wear jewelry? No. The fact that their worship um, practices were not like those of the pagans around them? No. Those people might have just said, they're prudes. They're, they're sexually repressed. They're all bound up. These things were not what marked them really as God's people. Not taking off jewelry. Not saying, well, there are certain practices that the world participates in that we don't. No. It was the presence of God. And only the presence of God that made them what they were. Without that, they were nobody. Nothing. And verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses is really pressing in, um, even though God's giving him assurance, he just, he needs more. I don't know about you, but I like, I've never had an end to my need for assurance. Now, maybe you're not like me, but I, I can always take a little more. And he continues there in verse 16. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And we already sort of addressed that issue. It's the presence of God. Verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. 
You know God can know us individually by name. He can know us by name. We can be on a first name basis with God. There are plenty of places where if we show up, we'll just be another face in the crowd. If you've ever been to a sporting event or a concert and there are literally thousands of people there, I don't know what the biggest crowd I've ever been a part of is, but I know once I was part of a crowd of 65,000 people and there were Two people in that crowd who knew my name. I'm up here in the cheap seats with the two people who knew me, or three maybe, and no one else in that, that room knew or cared that I was there, but God knew my name, and he knows your name. And I am aware more today, and I don't always know what to do about it, about the fact that we struggle to relate to one another. And that there are people who come to church sometimes who feel lonely and feel like they don't really belong. They're not really part of whatever they perceive to be the inner circle of the church is. And, and we've had people leave the church because they've said literally, they don't like me there. You think that's an exaggeration. It is not. But God knows your name. And he knows who you are. And you are important to him. Amen. A friend of mine was uh, struggling once. In school, financially, he'd come out of a terrible background, and he came to school basically with clothes on his back. And one day he went to a mailbox, and he never got mail from anybody because he literally did not have a family except for one brother. And there was a letter in a mailbox with a check in it made out to him for $100. It's been far enough back that that was a pretty good sign. And he wrote down three or four things in a, in a notebook, and one of those things that he wrote down is, was this. I am important to God. You may not be important to anybody in Greene County outside of maybe your most intimate family members, but you are important to God. God knew Moses' name. He knows your name. He does. Thank you. We've got a little amen corner right over here. She thinks I'm going to take her out for lunch after this. <laughs> I will, she asked. Verse 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, uh, then the Moses said, now, first he said, show me your ways so that I may you know, learn of you. And that's the most important thing. You know, when I was young, uh, we, we went younger, and I would be asked to sing solos in church. And you know, I, I've had a few voice lessons. I'm not a fully trained singer, but I've had a few voice lessons. And when I was younger, uh, I used to sing fairly well. And uh, you know what I thought was maybe way more important than, than proper warm-up and singing from your diaphragm? I, I thought I had to get alone with God. I couldn't get up here and sing without spending time asking for God's help and blessing. I just couldn't do it. I read later... That A.D. Simpson, the, one of the principal founders of the uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, said he never preached anywhere without spending a few moments alone with God. And Moses wants intimacy with God, and he says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. What does he expect to see? What does he expect to see? Let's move on. And the Lord says, now look at this verse 19, important. I will cause all my, what's the word? Yes, I will show my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have what? Mercy. On whom I will have mercy. And I will have what? Mercy. On whom I will have compassion. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. <laughs> I don't have a watch, and this, this clock says it's five after nine, so uh, I guess when you guys leave, I'll know it's time to quit here. Uh, I really don't know where we are time-wise, but you seem, are you with me? This is good stuff, church. It really is. And so God gives him an answer to reason. To his request. Now, what is the glory of God? 
What makes God glorious? People, poets might, or songwriter or somebody might talk about a glorious sunset. Um, I heard a song once called Glorious Morning. Last night I was out praying, and it's funny. I drove over a little hill, and I don't know where I was, but there was the moon. And later I, I saw uh, Sharon Thistleweight's Facebook page, and she simply had this, the moon. Did you see the moon last night? Do you know that the moon is considered a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit? In one of the Psalms, it, it says the moon is God's faithful witness in the sky. And last night, the moon was breathtakingly beautiful. So what makes God's glory God's glory? Is it power? Is it beauty? No. The glory of God is His holiness. It is a presence of holiness. When God shows up, his first encounter with Moses, he's there in front of this bush that's being burned, but it's not consumed by the fire. Moses walks over. God begins to speak to him. He says, take off your shoes, Moses, because you are standing on holy ground. What made the ground holy? The presence of God. Before it had been dirt or sand. Afterward, it would be dirt or sand. When God came, it was holy. Church, we need the presence of holiness in our midst. That very word makes people antsy or nervous. We're uncomfortable. But we desperately need the holy presence of God. We need holiness in our midst. And it can only come when God comes. Only God can make any person or place or thing holy. Other than that, we're just regular people. And regular people, if you run into too many of them, often are just not very nice people to be around. Have you noticed that? I have. <laughs> oh, some are better than others. And in polite society, we may all, you know, put on a facade. But there's something dark about us. And then, and God's holiness must invade our lives. Otherwise, we're just not very nice people. Then verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Now, I want to look, if we could, uh, Colin, at verse, uh, chapter 34. This is the next chapter, and it fleshes out this encounter in a little way that is not given to us here in, the, in chapter 33. And here's what happens. Passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. If you want to know what God's like, listen to what he says about himself. Maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations. God's mercy and compassion and willingness to forgive seems to be limitless. It just goes on and on and on. He limits his punishment of the guilty. He will not leave them unpunished. And part of the punishment that we receive if we are guilty is that our sin has consequences, not just for me, but for my children and my grandchildren and maybe my great-grandchildren. And God says it won't go forever because I want to limit this. But I cannot live in open, willful violation of the law of God and not have some consequence as a result of this. God is forgiving. To thank the Lord who's just. I know that when we do something wrong, we want mercy, not justice. But we need justice in this world. And we need to remember, church, our failures, our deliberate, willful failures to live under the authority of God will bring consequences, not just for us, but our children, their children, and maybe their children. There's something about the awful holiness of God. It has implications in every area of our lives. And he's already told Moses, you know, you can't see my face. You cannot see my face. 
Because no one can look upon my face and live. Why? And again, is it because God is more powerful than I am? Is it because God is in Incredibly impressive. You remember when Jesus was transfigured there, it's told in several places in the Gospels. Mark 9 is one of them. And Jesus is transfigured. All his clothing even lights up and radiates light. And the disciples are literally out of their minds. They don't know what to say. Is it because he's impressive in ways that none of us could ever be? It is because, no, it is because he is holy. And unholiness cannot stand in the presence of holiness. That is why the world hated the Jews. That's why the world sometimes hates Christians. Not because we may have uh, an austere, ascetic, uh, self-denying lifestyle. Most of us don't. Or not because we live differently than the world. Often many of us don't even do that. But what if we had the holy presence of God in our lives? That's something about that that makes evil. Why did Hitler want to kill Jews? And people today still hate it because they represent the presence of God. They are a visible manifestation that God is at work in the world. That's why Christians are hated, not because they've ever done anything wrong, but if they're holy people. Unholiness cannot stand in the presence of holiness. Don't shout me down now. Let's go back to 33, and I'm not sure where we left off, verse 20 or so. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. Verse 22, when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand. can we see God? He says you can't see me and live. We're told in the Old Testament that God dwells in unapproachable light. That phrase is included in one of the great hymns of the church. He dwells in unapproachable light. But how can we see God? Well, we're told in the letters of Paul that the glory of God has been revealed on the face of Jesus Christ and he is our rock. In him, we can come into the presence of God. In him, we can be saved. He is our great high priest. He knows our infirmities. And he tells us, come boldly to the throne of grace where you may find help in your time of need. He invites us to step out of the darkness and the fear that dominates our lives all too often and our inability to tell the truth about ourselves or even to ourselves. And through Jesus, we can know him. Many of you know my time in Waynesburg is uh, short. I have not resigned from this church, but it will be soon. And someone said, Pastor, why don't you sing a few songs before you leave? And this is not one that was requested. <laughs> but I'm going to sing it anyway. How are we going on time, anybody? Is it time for Wendy? Huh? Ten till. Ten till. All right. Well, this will be the close of the service. And to all of you who might watch this today or a few days from your computer screen or wherever, I apologize for leaving uh, this.
man is our God. He's there for us. Will we be there for him? Will we be there for him? He wants to know us by name. And he wants us to know him and his ways. Stand with me. Oh, Lord, we love you today. We're grateful for your faithful presence in our lives. Show us your ways. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us what you are God our Savior and all day long our hope is in you. Go with us now, Lord. Give us, as undeserving as we may be, your blessing and your grace. And we pray this in Christ's name.